Tonight on Dr. Osborne's Zone, we're talking about weird reasons your thyroid breaks down. Stay tuned, we'll be right back. You unlock this door with the key of compassion. Beyond it is another world, a world of science, a world of common sense, a world of sanity. You're moving into a land of both empathy and ethics, of nutritional knowledge and empowerment. You've just crossed over into Dr. Osborne's zone. Welcome to Dr. Osborne's zone. Today we're gonna to be diving into weird reasons your thyroid can break down. These are some of the things your doctor will never have a conversation about you with, but they are very common. Stick with me to the very end because we're also going to talk about strange side effects that can occur with your thyroid medications if you're taking them, but we're also going to be talking about natural solutions, things that you can do, supplements that you can take to help support the recovery of your thyroid. So let's dive in. Before we talk about the weird reasons the thyroid can break down, let's talk about the nutritional importance, what you need to know in terms of how your thyroid works in the first place. So this diagram will help to a certain extent illustrate how nutrients play a role in thyroid hormone, not only the production of thyroid hormone, but also the regulation of thyroid hormone. So starting in the pituitary gland of the brain, where we make this hormone called TSH, thyroid stimulating hormone. Now, the, to produce TSH, that requires protein and zinc. It also requires magnesium. And so again, these are nutrients that your body is, is not going to be able to make TSH adequately, we, adequately without. Once we make TSH, it travels to the thyroid gland itself and it interacts with the thyroid gland and stimulates it to make the inactive form of thyroid hormone called T4. Again, it's inactive, it has to be activated. Now to make T4, that requires iodine. And as a matter of fact, the iodine represents this four in T4. There are four molecules of iodine in T4, the T, is tyrosine, which is an amino acid, comes from eating protein. And so think of your thyroid hormone as a racing car where the, the tyrosine forms the car's frame and then the four molecules of iodine form the tires. Now, in order to make T4, we need iodine and tyrosine, but we also need other nutrients. We need nutrients like inositol, we need vitamin B2, we need vitamin C. So these nutrients are all very important for the biochemistry, for that underlying building of T4 as thyroid hormone. Once we do that, this thyroid hormone will hit your bloodstream and it will travel to the liver. And it's the liver where we make the active version of thyroid hormone, that is called T3. So again, we have to activate thyroid hormone into T3. Now to do that in the liver requires selenium, which is a mineral, but also requires iron. And so what oftentimes will happen, this is especially true of menstruating females, is they'll lose iron every month because of the cycle, and they'll be more prone to this transient iron deficiency, and these fluctuations can affect your ability to convert T4, inactive thyroid hormone, into active thyroid hormone. This process also requires selenium, and selenium is one of those nutrients because of the highly processed food diets that are consumed in most industrial countries. Selenium is a very, very common deficiency that we find. And so again, these two nutrients necessary for this conversion. Now, the liver is also necessary for this conversion, so the liver has to be healthy. And so what we oftentimes see happen, especially in the elderly, we see a situation called polypharmacy. Polypharmacy, just simply put, means you're on multiple medications at the same time. Maybe you're on a cholesterol medicine, a blood pressure medication. Maybe you're on a medication to regulate your blood sugar, et cetera, et cetera. But more medications, if they're processed by the liver, can slow down the functionality of the liver. And so this polypharmacy can also sometimes contribute to poor conversion of T4 to T3. So it's important to remember that as well, because again, 
if you're if you're on multiple medications, it's going to hinder this potential. Now, once you get T3, T3 is going to travel through the bloodstream, and it's going to travel to the different cells. The job of T3 is to get inside the cell and to get into what's called a nuclear receptor. So in the surface of your cell nucleus, we we'll call that here your cell nucleus, there are these receptors that stick off. They're called nuclear receptors. Um, predominant, one of the most predominant types of receptors here is called a retinoic acid receptor, or RA. And this is how the T3 communicates to the DNA. And so what has to happen is that T3 has to bind to that receptor and stimulate the upregulation of certain genes to elevate or to increase metabolic function. So in order for T3 to bind to that receptor, that requires vitamin A. It also requires vitamin D because those receptors also um, important uh, component of those receptors is also vitamin D. So you need those nutrients for healthy thyroid hormone function to work as well. Now, this cell membrane itself on the outside and on the inside, the nuclear membrane, those require, in order for them to maintain their healthy fluidity, think of that experiment you did probably in grade school where you poured a little bit of water into a cup and then you poured some oil into the same cup and you saw that, that the water and the oil separated from each other. And the oil, if it was like an olive oil, it was, was permeable. If you stuck a pen through the oil, it would go through the pen. Now imagine that same experiment where instead of using something like olive oil, you're using coconut oil or you're using Crisco, that old saturated fat that uh, grandmas used to cook with, right? And so we don't want our cell membranes to be like Crisco or coconut oil. We want them to be permeable and flexible at the same time. And this permeability in the membrane requires omega-3 fatty acids. They, they also regulate the inflammation or the inflammation potential of the cell itself. So these omega-3 fatty acids are very important for the permeability of the membrane so that the T3 hormone can get into the cell and then attach and then get through the nuclear membrane to the DNA itself. So again, one more nutrient in the line of important nutrients that you want to understand are, are critical for the healthy functioning and healthy communication of your thyroid hormone to your cells to improve your metabolism. Now, remember, metabolism is not weight loss. A lot of people misconstrue uh, the term metabolism with weight loss, meaning um, what is metabolism? Let's sum it up. It's, it's two factors. You have what are called catabolic and you have what are called anabolic reactions. When you add catabolic and anabolic reactions together, that equals metabolism. So catabolic reactions are reactions that break tissue down. So when you have an old cell and it needs to be broken down and replaced, we break it down first. That's a catabolic reaction. We also then want to replace that cell and make a new cell. And so anabolic reactions are growth reactions, are building reactions. And so metabolism is a balance between the cat catabolic and metabolic function of the body. And they're both regulated by your thyroid hormone. And that's what makes this hormone so important. Because if you get an imbalance between catabolic and anabolic, you can have what's called a repair deficit where your body breaks down faster than it can repair and heal itself. And then lots of things start to break down. So now you're starting to understand the importance of thyroid hormone. Let's talk about some of the symptoms also of a low thyroid. Now, this is not an all-inclusive list, but these are some of the more common things that can occur to, uh, to folks that develop low thyroid. So the first one is just general low energy or fatigue. Re again, we're talking about metabolism, and metabolism is, again, the reactions, the chemical reactions, including those that produce energy. We also see a lot of hair loss in folks that have low thyroid function, as well as dry skin, and low libido, constipation, joint pain, because you're, again, what I said earlier, your body is breaking tissue down faster than it's rebuilding. So joint pain is one of the side effects of that. Muscle stiffness and tightness, 
weight gain, but also weight loss. This is one of those where it could go either direction. Most, most people associate, most doctors associate hypothyroidism with weight gain, but a lot of women actually can't put weight on. Again, their metabolisms are slowing down, so their anabolic function, their building reactions aren't working as well, and so they can't put weight on. So it's not always about um, weight gain. And then gut dysfunction as well, gas, bloating, intestinal discomfort, you know, these two kind of go together with one another. So those are symptoms to kind of watch out for, but let's talk about, again, weird causes of low thyroid. What actually contributes to low thyroid? We're gonna get into the vitamins and the minerals in a minute. I just gave you kind of a mini crash course on that. But some of the things that cause low thyroid are the things you put in your mouth. Now, those of you watching this show, I like a little participation. How many of you, when visiting your doctor, if you have low thyroid, how many of you had a doctor that actually sat down and talked with you about diet change as a dominant way to get your thyroid back under control? Raise your hand, just put a comment below in the chat box for me. I'd like to, I'll go back and read those later. But Diet is very rarely discussed amongst doctors, especially amongst endocrinologists. As a matter of fact, if, if I had a quarter for every time I heard an endocrinologist tell a patient that diet has nothing to do with low thyroid, and this is low thyroid, whether it's just classic hypothyroidism or whether we're talking about Hashimoto's thyroiditis. But these are three big factors that we're certain can create increases in inflammation that can disrupt your thyroid function. Gluten, dairy, and sugar. And so changing how you eat can, in many cases, and I've seen this happen in, in many, many cases where the actual thyroid condition starts to go away altogether. So this is how powerful diet is. Now I'm gonna show you some research studies on diet, so we look at several of these are on, on gluten sensitivity, and you can see your effect of a gluten-free diet on autoimmune thyroiditis progression in patients with no symptoms or histology of celiac disease. In other words, these are people that aren't diagnosed with celiac disease, um, but they're still going on a gluten-free diet because they have autoimmune thyroiditis. And so in the result column, you can see here, our results seem to indicate a positive effect of the gluten deprivation, meaning a gluten-free diet, on thyroid function and its inflammation, particularly in patients with Hashimoto's thyroiditis and, um, and gluten-related conditions. So again, in this study, they found that a gluten-free diet was actually helpful at reducing the antibody um, inflammation in patients with Hashimoto's. Now, in this research study, also related to gluten, you can see the presence of anti-gliadin antibodies in autoimmune thyroid disease. Anti-gliadin, gliadin refers to gluten. So when you hear that word gliadin in the future, you know that gliadin is a type of gluten. It's uh, the main type of gluten. It might help if I spelled this right for you. It's the main type of gluten found in wheat. So it's an anti-gliadin antibody. Uh, in autoimmune thyroid disease. You can see they did 22 patients in this particular study with autoimmune thyroid had positive anti-gliadin antibodies. So 5% of the patients that they studied, 5.5% had actual positive anti-gliadin antibodies. Conclusion, polyglandular endocrine syndrome is the commonest cause of positivity of anti-gliadin antibodies in the patients with autoimmune thyroid disease. Now I would argue, this is a good study because it makes the connection, but I would argue that this study actually wasn't finding quite as many people with gluten problems as maybe it could have, and let me explain why. When you're looking for these antibodies, these gluten antibodies, generally what, what doctors are measuring is they're measuring IgA is a type of antibody. And so they're generally what they're measuring is antibodies to IgA. Well, one of the side effects of gluten exposure over long periods is IgA antibody deficiency. So what happens is you get these patients that um, they're, they're testing their antibodies to gluten, to gliadin, and um, they're finding that, in this case at least, 5% had high levels of antibodies, but how many of these patients actually had an IgA deficiency, and so when they went to look for antibodies, they couldn't find them because the patient actually wasn't making antibodies, and so you get a false negative on an antibody test. It's a very, very common thing that's seen 
Um, and it's a very common problem that's been linked to people with gluten sensitivity is something called IgA deficiency. So again, there's a study here that correlates gluten antibodies in patients with thyroid disease. And then we have another one here, effective. So that one shows the connection. This one actually shows the outcome, right? So the effect of a gluten-free diet on autoimmune thyroiditis. Down here, you see our results seem to indicate a positive effect of the gluten deprivation on thyroid function and its inflammation, particularly in patients with Hashimoto's thyroiditis and gluten-related conditions. Again, um, then we have this study here. You can see gluten elevates thyroid inflammatory antibodies for up to six months. So again, eating gluten caused elevation in thyroid antibodies this long a period of time. Now, if you've ever watched my course, I've done a course on how long does it take to get gluten out of your system. Generally, um, the answer is three months, but in this case, gluten exposure causing antibody elevations for up to six months. And again, why is that important to understand? because these antibodies are inflammatory and they do inflammatory damage to the thyroid gland. Then we have the effect of the gluten-free diet on, thought, on thyroid autoimmunity in drug-naive women. And you can see here the gluten-free diet reduced thyroid antibody titers as well as increased 25 hydroxy vitamin D levels. So in this study, we got lower antibodies and we got improvement in vitamin D. That's what 25 OHD is. So going gluten free, elevate, actually improve vitamin D and reduce the antibodies. And you know, the, the, some speculate as to why would a gluten free diet improve a person's vitamin D status? You know, we're not talking about a, a situation where we're supplementing people with vitamin D. We're just talking about vitamin D levels improving as a result of a gluten free diet. And one of the biggest reasons is inflammation. So what happens? in a gluten-free diet. If a person's gluten sensitive particularly, what happens is going gluten-free reduces inflammation. And when you reduce inflammation, you don't need as much vitamin D because vitamin D is an anti-inflammatory. It actually is an, in, well, technically it's not anti-inflammatory, but it regulates inflammation. It helps the body regulate and control inflammation. So when inflammation is lower, your body doesn't have to use as much vitamin D and so there's more, there's a sparing effect, if you will, on vitamin D. And so one of the reasons potentially why vitamin D is going up with a gluten-free diet. So again, going gluten-free, lots of benefit associated with, especially with Hashimoto's disease. Now there are other foods that can contribute to goiter and I don't wanna sound like an alarmist. So as you look at this list on the board here, don't think that you can never have any of these foods ever again for the rest of your life if you are dealing with a thyroid problem. What I'm pointing out here is that these foods are also sometimes refer referred to as goitrogens. In other words, they can contribute to dysfunction in the thyroid. So it's not so much that you could never eat peaches or strawberries again. However, if these are your primary staple foods and you're throwing all these things into a big smoothie every morning and drinking it green in large quantities, which a lot of people do, they put flax and spinach and broccoli and kale and they blend it in a blender and sometimes they'll add in strawberries and then they'll pour in their soy milk and that's breakfast every day. That's a thyroid bomb. You're taking too many of these goitrogens and you're putting them all together and then you're creating you know, a primary source of calories from these foods alone. So again, it's not that you can't eat these foods if you have a thyroid problem, it's that you wanna be aware that if you overconsume these, uh, these foods consistently, you may be creating or contributing to goiter formation in your thyroid. And so again, a goiter, we got this image here. If you look at this image, you can see this outline of this enlargement in the neck. That's kind of what a goiter is a cartoon figure, but that's what happens is you get an enlargement in the neck because the thyroid um, starts to grow. Now there's some other things in the diet that can impact the thyroid that we'll share with you as well. And one of them is sugar substitutes. This was a study published a few years ago. Excessive use has been linked, so we're talking here, excessive use has been linked to hyperphagia and obesity related disorders. And in this case, we're talking about artificial sweeteners or what are known as non-nutritive 
sweeteners. You can see animal studies report that artificial sweeteners affect the immune system. Moreover, animal studies show that sucralose diminishes the thyroid axis activity. We are presenting the case of a 52-year-old female with autoimmune thyroiditis with hypothyroidism or Hashimoto's induced by an excessive intake of beverages containing non-nutritive sweeteners. So if you're sitting there holding the 72 ounce stop and go mug full of Diet Coke, I'm talking to you. It's the excessive quantity of these non-nutritive sweeteners that can impact your ability to make thyroid hormone. In this case, the quick return of thyroid stimulating hormone and antibody levels to normal after eliminating the use of sugar substitutes. So again, this is a medical case report of a woman who was over consuming these beverages and when she stopped doing it, it normalized her antibodies and improved her thyroid hormone function output. Now there's a reason why this happens in particular with a type of sweetener called sucralose which is what this study was based on. Sucralose, AKA Splenda is I think the brand name of this product. What is it exactly? What is Splenda? It's, it's chlorinated sugar, right? So what they did to make this stuff is they just added chlorine to sugar. And one of the problems with chlorine, when we look at what chlorine actually is, chlorine is something called a halide. Now, there, there are a number of different halides. Let's move this out of the way and make some room. Halides, if you look at a periodic table of elements, include iodine, chlorine, fluorine or fluoride, and bromine. So these are the kind of, the, again, all fall on the same uh, section of the periodic table of elements. This group is, is referred to as halides. And what do we know about halides? We know that these three here compete for uptake into your thyroid with iodine. So remember, iodine has specialized um, little devices or little importers on the surface of thyroid cells that where there's special channels designed for the uptake of iodine. And so what happens is these are these other three are so similar to iodine, they will compete for uptake into the thyroid gland through those transporters. And so if you're consuming large quantities of sucralose, which again, it's chlorinated sugar, it's got chlorine uh, attached to it, you're increasing the competition between iodine uptake and chlorine. And if, you, if chlorine wins this war, right, then you can impact how much iodine is available for your thyroid to use. Remember what we said earlier, T4, which is thyroid hormone, that four represents four molecules of iodine. So again, if you've got excessive chlorine coming into the diet, you're gonna inhibit that iodine uptake. So in this case, it's sucralose, but there are other examples where we get too much chlorine as well. Swimming pools, if you're in a swimming pool every day, especially indoor pools where the chlorine vapors sit on top of the, uh, of the water that you can breathe them in much more easily, plus you're bathing in chlorine as well, and it can absorb through the skin. But we also get chlorine in our drinking water. If you live in a city and you're drinking tap water, you're getting chlorine every day, and that can have a huge impact on how your thyroid hormone is going to be produced and functioned. And then we've also got, again, fluoride and bromine. And so what, what do we think about here? We think about things like the toothpaste that you're using. You know, a lot of the dentists tell you how awesome fluoride is for you, um, for your teeth, and, and really it's not necessary. You don't need a fluoridated toothpaste. You don't need a fluoridated mouthwash. I would argue that those things are, are doing more harm than good. We also have fluoridated, fluoridation to the water as well. So if you think about tap water, tap water is like one of the worst things that you could drink for your thyroid. If you want healthy thyroid gland function, you know, don't drink tap water. Um, drink a spring water or filter your water. You know, there are great filters that'll pull fluorine and, and, uh, and chloride and bromine out of your water because bromine is another one that sometimes gets added to the tap water. It gets added to the municipal water supply because why? These things kill life. This is why they get added. Um, they're 
they're antibiotic in a sense, they're antiseptic to the water supply. So the city will clean or make sure that you're not drinking, you know, festering bacteria in your water, which is a good thing. However, when that water makes it to your house, you don't want to take in these antibiotics, these natural antibiotics into your body. So now the next step would be it comes to your house, you filter that stuff out as you drink it. And that way you don't have to worry about it and you can still drink clean water that's not um, that's not contaminated with bacteria, but also not contaminated with halides that will compete with iodine for uptake into your thyroid and destroy how your thyroid functions. So quick crash course on that. Now we also have another common beverage that most people drink every morning and that's coffee. And I'm not trying to take away your coffee, but I just wanna point some things out um, around coffee and thyroid. Specifically, this is for those of you who are gluten sensitive and for those of you who are taking thyroid medication, okay? So you can see here, coffee intake led to a decrease Okay, and I'm gonna fast forward because we don't really need this information because we're not talking about type one diabetics and rheumatoid arthritis, at least not today. Coffee intake led to a decrease in levothyroxine absorption in Hashimoto's disease. What does that mean? What is levothyroxine? Levothyroxine is thyroid medicine. It's one, it's one of the most commonly prescribed medicines in the United States. I think it's in the top five of all drugs, but it's the most common thyroid medication prescribed to folks that have low thyroid. And so if you are taking levothyroxine and you're drinking coffee to take it, you could reduce its absorption and then you could reduce its, its functionality or its, its, its um, ability to help you, right? So just be aware of that. You know, this is one of the reasons why on these medications, it'll say take a couple of hours away from eating, but also in this case, away from drinking your coffee. Now, the other thing that it's important to understand, I said those of you who are taking medicine, but I also said those of you with gluten sensitivity, is that coffee consumption is associated with cross-reactivity with gliadin antibodies in celiac patients. So, what does cross-reactivity mean? As we look at gluten, and we're just, let's just draw kind of a generic Let's say that gluten looks like this, okay? What does cross-reactivity mean? Well, let's say that coffee, elements in coffee, also look like this, right? They look very, very similar. They have what, what we call in biology homology. They look very much the same. So if you are reacting to gluten and you're drinking coffee, and this isn't for everyone, but this is for many. I see a lot of people with gluten sensitivity also react to coffee. But if you're reactive to gluten and you're drinking coffee, then that coffee can look similar to gluten and so your immune system might take it, take it on, right? So this creates an immune response as if the coffee was gluten. And what did we just show you? We just spent the better half of a few minutes anyway um, talking about the association of you know, gluten and the gluten-free diet on autoimmune thyroiditis, right? So we've got all these studies that have been shown where gluten in increases autoimmune thyroid disease. So if coffee can mimic gluten, basically, wouldn't it go to say that you should be careful potentially about it if you're tr struggling with persistent chronic hyper or hypothyroid autoimmune disease and you're not getting better and the medicine's not helping and you're drinking coffee, maybe one or two cups a day or more, you know, you might want to reconsider that. Again, I'm not trying to take away everyone's coffee, but there's definitely a connection here and I've seen it in a number of folks. All right, let's talk next about toxic chemicals. These toxic chemicals are known to disrupt thyroid hormone function. And I've already talked a little bit about fluoride. So you get that in toothpaste, mouthwash. You can get that when you go to the dentist. It's fluoridated water. But fluoride competes with iodine uptake into your thyroid gland so it can disrupt thyroid function in that way. We've also got things like glyphosate. Glyphosate acts as a chelating agent. It was actually originally designed as a chelating, as a descaler 
um, or, or chelating agent to bind to metals. One of the metals it can bind to is manganese. And so manganese being very important, there are research studies that show that low manganese equals low thyroid. And likewise, that higher levels of manganese equals higher thyroid functioning. And we again, glyphosate um, exposure binds manganese and can prevent its absorption. We know bromine. Bromine is a common chemical uh, found in water, but it's also found in a lot of the breads today. You know, the flour, if you've ever gone to the supermarket and look at a bag of flour, you'll oftentimes see this term brominated. We know that a lot of pesticides and herbicides are where, where they use bromine, also use fluoride. And these, there's a name for the, for the grouping of these chemicals. They're called halogenated pesticides or biocides. And they're used in a lot of different applications industrially. Um, and then we have plastics. You know, plastics nowadays full of a number of different types of chemicals. Probably the, the most famous chemical, the one getting the most press, is BPA. And BPA can definitely disrupt thyroid hormone uh, function and production. But let's talk a little bit more in depth about some of these other chemicals because obviously if you know what they are, then you can work on avoiding them. So let's see here. Let's pull this one up. So you can see this is a, a recent review study published in Molecular Cell Endocrinology. The impact of endocrine disrupting chemical exposure in the mammalian hypothalamic pituitary axis. So there's a growing evidence that exposure to EDCs, what is an EDC? It's an endocrine disrupting chemical, right? In this case, we're talking about thyroid gland, which is an endocrine organ, and such as bisphenol A or BPA, some phthalates, phthalates are the things that make plastic um, kind of soft and pliable, polychlorinated biphenyls or PCBs, notice that word again, chlorinated, it's chlorine, it's a halogen, it's a halide. So anytime we run into chlorine, bromine, and fluoride in chemical products, remember that's going to compete with iodine uptake into your thyroid. So when you see those words like that um, and you're reading things in your like household cleaners and other things around your house and you struggle with thyroid disease, these are things you might want to try to replace with, with more natural items. You see again, polybrominated, so bromine, diphenyl ethers, and biphenyls and dichlorodiphenyl trichloroethane or DDT as well as tributylin and atrazine is associated with HP axis abnormalities. EDCs act on hormone receptors and their downstream signaling pathways and can interfere with hormone synthesis, metabolism, and action. So multiple ways they can disrupt your endocrine system including your thyroid. So let's look at this study here um, because it does a nice job of some summarization of how some of these chemicals can impact your thyroid gland function. So the interference of xenobiotics, xenobiotics, these are chemicals with endocrine regulatory mechanisms has been well established. I think that's an important thing to underline. We're not talking about theory or conjecture. We're talking about a well-established fact in the medical literature that xenobiotics disrupt the endocrine system. And in this, you know, in this diagram, we've got a number of these chemicals that we know can disrupt the thyroid. One is phthalates. Okay, phthalates, which are, you know, when you're drinking out of that plastic water bottle, when you're drinking from that plastic straw, um, those types of things. You can see induces hyperactivity of an iodine transporter and can actually contribute to hyperthyroidism. We also know that thiocyanates, nitrates, these are, you know, predominantly the nitrates are fertilizers. We use a lot of these fertilizers in our farming practices nowadays, uh, as well as perchlorates, which are byproducts of things like jet fuel, as well as soy isoflavones. Remember I showed you earlier the, the foods, the goitrogenic foods that could be problematic. Well, this is soy showing up here. Um, Soy is used a lot. A lot of soy oil is used as, as, a, as an agent in a number of different products. And so, again, it's not just the soy that you eat, but you may be applying makeups and cosmetics and hair care products and soaps and shampoos that are soy derivative. And so you can see that soy 
and nitrates block thyroid peroxidase enzyme, also known as TPO. Thyroid peroxidase is one of the most important enzymes in the production of thyroid hormone, and so this can contribute to hypothyroidism. And then we have benzophenone and PCBs and hexachlorobenzene and flame retardants. These flame retardants that are commonly sprayed on clothes and fabrics, carpets, you know, so if you're building a new house or, or buying a new mattress or buying new clothes, you know, this is where you can get into trouble with some of these things. Um, these are brominated, so bromine, again, brominated um, flame retardants are doused on these things to prevent them from catching fire. Um, and so you can see here competitive binding to thyroid hormone binding prealbumin. So again, interrupting or interfering with how the thyroid hormone can be produced. Um, you can also see with these flame retardants, enhanced hepatic metabolism, altered binding of thyroid hormone to its receptor, inhibition of constitutive activity of TSH receptor, increased hepatic metabolism of thyroid hormones. In other words, it breaks your thyroid hormones down quicker and it prevents them from being built and it reduces the peripheral conversion of T4 to T3. What we were talking about earlier, the inactive form of thyroid hormone is T4, has to be converted to T3 to be activated. And again, this class of chemicals basically interferes with that. And then you have pesticides and fungicides as well. So all of these things, you know, you should be thinking about how you can reduce your exposure to these things. What's the best thing that you can do to reduce your exposure, we'll look at where we find these. Plastic containers and plastic feeding tubes, cabbage, green leafy vegetables. Again, I'm not saying don't ever eat those ever again in your life, but you shouldn't be juicing mass quantities of these things if you're struggling with a thyroid problem. Nitrate-based fertilizers. So again, this is where, you know, going to the local farmer's market and buying organic where they're not using a lot of these fertilizers. And then you've got a lot of the soy products, sunscreen containing cosmetics, coolants of capacitors and transformers. Most of you, unless you work in that industry, won't be so much uh, exposed to those. But how many of you are using sunscreens and cosmetics? Uh, this is actually one of the reasons why we speculate women have a higher incidence of hypothyroidism than men has to do with they're more apt to use these types of products. And then um, we also have, again, pesticides and herbicides. Are you buying organic or using organic? Are you spraying your lawn with chemicals or hiring somebody to spray your lawn with chemicals and then going outside and lying in the grass, et cetera? So exposure, minimize it as best you can to avoid these things. Now let's look here at, this, this was a really great paper. Um, it's got some nice diagrammatic representations of things that can affect the thyroid in, in a couple of different ways. So you can see in this first diagram on the left, it's established and plausible environmental risk factors for thyroid cancer. Because why, why, why are we worried about thyroid cancer? Because a lot of people, before they develop thyroid cancer, that starts with inflammation, right? And what, what have we been talking about mostly today? We've been talking about Hashimoto's, which is what? Hashimoto's is a inflammation, it's an autoimmune inflammation of the thyroid. Well, if you have enough inflammation that goes on for a long enough period of time, cancer can be the outcome or the end stage outcome. And if you look at a lot of the things that contribute to thyroid cancer, it's a lot of the same things that we just talked about. Pesticides, plasticizers, perchlorates, radiation, um, particulate matter and air pollution, perfluorinated, fluor and again, that's fluoride, fluorine, perfluorinated compounds, metalloids, nitrates, fertilizers, heavy metals like zinc, or not zinc, but cadmium and lead uh, have been linked to thyroid carcinomas, and then brominated flame retardants, as we were talking about, and then dioxin compounds as well. And then we come over to this other chart, and we can see endocrine disrupting chemicals Okay, and in this case, a lot of the same things that we've just mentioned, PCBs and PBDEs. One of the things I'll, I'll also, you know, bring up, I, I think is, is relevant, especially in today's world, is this ingredient here called triclosan. Triclosan is one of the major active ingredients in all of these hand sanitizers that everyone's going crazy with. You walk into a 
uh, a hotel, you walk into a restaurant, you walk into a schoolhouse and they've got all these little pump stations that are set up for you to just douse your hands in chemical triclosan in the fear for the fear of germs, right? And those chemicals absorb through your skin and disrupt your endocrine system, including your thyroid. But then what is, what is one of the other common practices we're seeing a lot right now um, as an overlap from what's gone on in the last few years is mask wearing. And one of the things that masks are sprayed with is a chemical substance called PFAS, perfluoral alkyl substances. This is what waterproofs the mask, right? And so you spray that all over a mask and then you wear that mask all over your face and then you're breathing in what, what scientists are now calling forever chemicals because they're very, very hard to break down and get rid of. And you're breathing that directly into your, your body. And so again, it's an endocrine disrupting compound. And one of the biggest reasons why this is not a great idea nor is the excessive use of these hand sanitizers. So you wanna wash your hands with soap and water, that's a great way to do it. But um, I, would, I would try to avoid this. You got here benzophenone, again, we talked about that a moment ago, disrupts TPO activation. Um, so TPO is thyroid peroxidase, it's one of the enzymes responsible for building thyroid hormone. And then PCBs, they um, create a, an enhanced enzyme activity and breakdown of thyroid hormones and you've got PCBs, um, which inhibit the deiodinization of thyroid hormone. What does that mean, the deiodinization? It means that to take T4 and convert it into T3, that's called deiodination. That's what that's called, this term right here. And because you're removing one iodine. And so what these chemicals do is in inhibit the activation to active thyroid hormone itself. And so again, as you go around this circle, you can see a number of different chemicals and a number of different mechanisms of interference with thyroid active activity. So the, the, the kind of the, the bottom line with all this is what can we do? We can avoid these things as much as we possibly can. Don't go looking for them on purpose. Obviously, don't, don't use products um, including things like cosmetics, fertilizers. Again, the best thing you can do, ladies, is find natural alternatives for cosmetics, find natural healthcare products or uh, hygiene products for your soaps, for your shampoos, et cetera, um, and avoid as much of that as you can while eating organic, and you're gonna reduce your exposure and your risk of thyroid inhibition and thyroid problems. Okay. So back to our diagram, as I was mentioning before, all of the nutritional relationship with how your thyroid actually works. And again, how many of you have had a doctor sit down and say, you know, we really want to be concerned about nutrition in your thyroid, you know, and chime in. If you've had a doctor sit down and talk to you about nutrition, great. If you haven't, I'd just like to kind of poll you guys to see what you've been all been being told. But um, some research on this, right? So multiple nutritional factors in the risk of Hashimoto's thyroiditis. You can see here there's evidence from the observational and randomized controlled trials that selenium can reduce thyroid peroxidase antibodies. So if, if you're familiar with that, TPO antibodies are one of the markers that your doctor will measure um, to help diagnose you with Hashimoto's or not, right? And so in this case, selenium, adequate selenium will reduce these, th these antibodies. And there are a number of mechanisms behind how that works, but a number of studies have shown that. We also know that iron deficiency impairs thyroid metabolism. I showed you that earlier. The conversion of T4 to T3 requires iron. We also know, moving through this, we know that because many with autoimmune disease that have autoimmune thyroid disease also have autoimmune gastritis, these two oftentimes go hand in hand. And one of the problems or byproducts of gastritis is low iron. And so if you're 
autoimmune thyroid, but your gut is also damaged and inflamed, you're gonna reduce your capacity to absorb iron. And if you're also menstruating, you're losing iron every month. You can see how this could become a major problem. And if you cross-reference the symptoms of iron deficiency with the symptoms of hypothyroidism, they look very, very similar. And so one could argue, is it hypothyroidism or is it really iron deficiency contributing to hypothyroidism and just being diagnosed as hypothyroidism and the doctors are just not looking at iron at all. We also know that lower vitamin D status has been found in hypothyroid patients, Hashimoto's thyroiditis patients, um, more so than in control groups and inverse relationships of vitamin D with TPO antibodies have been reported. In other words, the lower your vitamin D, the higher your thyroid antibodies tend to be. So their conclusion in this paper was, clinicians should check patients' iron, particularly in menstruating women and vitamin D status to correct any deficiency. Raise your hand in the comment section if you've had your vitamin D and your iron levels checked by your endocrinologist or if they were just putting you on thyroid medication and telling you diet and nutrition had nothing to do with it. Adequate selenium intake is vital in areas of iodine deficiency excess, and in regions of low selenium intake, a supplement of 50 to 100 micrograms a day of selenium may be appropriate. So again, this is a nice little paper on vitamin D, iron, and selenium. Let's see here. Here's a nice one on inositol. Now, I mentioned earlier that inositol was important in the production of thyroid hormone. But in this, this was actually a human trial where they were using inositol in autoimmune thyroiditis. And you, know, you can see here, inositol has a determinant role in thyroid function in autoimmune disease as it regulates iodine organification and thyroid hormone biosynthesis. So again, plays a role in the production of thyroid hormone. Um, what we know is um, TSH levels significantly decreased in patients with subclinical hypothyroidism with or without autoimmune thyroiditis after treatment with inositol plus selenium. So this was a kind of a combo where they were using the two in tandem together. In addition to TSH, so in essence, the TSH improved. They saw a lowering of TSH. Remember that high TSH equals low thyroid function. A lot of people get confused about, about that because they're opposite. Where, and then what they also saw though, by giving this combination of nutrients is they saw a reduction in antibodies, TPO, thyroid peroxidase antibodies. So, um, you know, again, how many of you have had an endocrinologist put you on inositol or selenium? And how many of you have had an endocrinologist bother to even check your inositol or your selenium? So nutrition, very, very important. Here's another paper on some factors, uh, nutritional factors around the management of autoimmune thyroid disease. Now I like this diagram here uh, that this author put together. You see here is kind of a three contributing factors centering in on Hashimoto's. But we've got genetic factors. You know, a lot of doctors will say you know, low thyroid is genetic. There's no other contributing factor. You're just gonna have it because it's genetic, which is nonsense, but that's not to say that there aren't genetic factors. Well, one of the genetic factors is what's called the major histocompatibility complex or the MHC. Now this is uh, part of the same genetic factor that we look at for gluten, but one of the major genes related that we're discussing here is something called HLA DQ genes. And so these genes, increase certain, certain parameters of these genes or certain um, variants of this genetic marker, there's an alpha one and a beta one HLA DQ gene, but certain variants of, of these genes will increase the predisposition or likelihood of the development of celiac disease, which is also associated with Hashimoto's which has also um, got association with rheumatoid arthritis and type one diabetes. Um, so these are all, what is the trend here? These are all autoimmune diseases and that's what this, these genes are predisposition genes to the development of autoimmunity. And so that's where there is some genetic overtone. But remember, if we're looking at how much of it is genetic versus how much of it is 
you know, all the chemicals we've been talking about, the nutritional deficiencies, the potential for eating gluten, 30% is genetic. Pretty much the rest of the 70% is a combination of what you see down here, which is environmental and nutritional factors. And then as well, some of these factors over here, you can't really control. I mean, well, you can, you can control whether or not you become a parent, but you can't control your age. It just happens and you can't control, well, <laughs> you shouldn't be able to control your gender, although some are trying to argue that nowadays, I don't agree with it, but, um, but gender and, and age. But here we have environmental and nutritional factors, smoking, alcohol consumption, iodine deficiency, selenium deficiency, vitamin D intake, whether or not you have the presence of infections, and then environmental stress and certain medications. So, um, you know, I would add to this list of things, all the chemical disruptors that we just talked about. So, but again, in this, in this study, you can see here, observational and controlled trials have shown frequent nutrition deficiencies in Hashimoto's thyroid patients. In literature, there is evidence for selenium, potassium, iodine, copper, magnesium, zinc, iron, vitamin A, C, vitamin D, and vitamin B. The role of the proper level of protein intake as well as dietary fiber and unsaturated fatty acids, especially the omega-3 family, has been indicated. We talked about a lot of that already um, at the beginning of the show here. Hi Hashimoto's thyroiditis patients should often eliminate lactose because of intolerance and interactions with levothyroxine, me meaning that um, a lot of these people, because a lot of these people with Hashimoto's are also gluten sensitive. Remember there's that connection. And it's a, it's, a, it's a rough estimation, but it's 70 plus percent also have lactose intolerance and this this can interact this can create problems in the bowel it can increase the risk for abnormal bacterial overgrowth um, what, what they're kind of referring to here is infection it's you know really more of an overgrowth um, but also because of the interference as well with absorption of thyroid medication and and then you see here and gluten because of possible interactions with gliadin with of, or possible interactions of gliadin with thyroid antigens. So again, just a quick summary: lots of nutrients listed out there as being important, but also being present in the medical literature. In other words, things that have been studied to be low in patients with Hashimoto's disease. And so you definitely want to understand that because if you do, then you can ask for the right tests. And this comes back to why are we why are we teaching all of this? It's because low thyroid, high, whether you have hypothyroidism or whether you've been diagnosed with Hashimoto's, it's one of the most common diagnoses given to women, especially over the age of 40, in industrialized countries. I believe we're seeing an increase, and we're seeing so much of the diagnosis because of the mass exposure to chemicals, but also the mass consumption of gluten coupled with highly processed foods, bad dietary choices, poor behavioral um, environmental factors, and that's leading to just a fundamental breakdown of the gland. And what most doctors' solution is, is they measure your, T well, they measure your TSH. You go to, generally, if you go to an endocrinologist, they'll measure your TSH, they may measure your T3, they may measure your T4, not always. And sometimes they'll measure your antibodies on an initial visit. So this is the comprehensive blood work that you're going to get typically if you go to a regular doctor to assess your thyroid. And this is nowhere near comprehensive enough to assess anything. It's, it's only measuring whether or not your TSH is within a certain range and whether these other things are within a certain range. But what about all these other variable things that we've talked about today, like the vitamin A and the vitamin D and the omega-3 and the vitamin C and the iodine, etc. Your thyroid can't work. It can't perform. It can't be produced. You can't produce receptors. The receptors won't work. They won't bind well. They Membranes around the cells won't work properly if you don't have these nutrients. But doctors aren't assessing any of these things. They're taking such an asinine, simplistic approach to assessing you. And then what's the answer? You have a low thyroid. 
it's genetic, you need to medicate for the rest of your life. Now, some would say, well, that's relatively benign. The medicine can't be all that bad for a person. What does it cost you to medicate for the rest of your life? And if the medication doesn't really help all of your symptoms that much, what does it cost you in quality of life for the rest of your life to have this hoisted upon your shoulders with kind of a fatalistic attitude of there's nothing that we can do? And it's not that there's nothing they can't do, it's that they're not doing it. And it's that they're not reading their own medical literature and they're not applying common sense science to their clinical practices. Now, I'm not saying that every endocrinologist or every doctor is guilty of this. I'm just simply saying that my experience has been vastly with women being gaslighted and being told this and nobody's ever even bothered to check anything nutritionally ever about them. And, and so this list that you see here would be a way to assess much more accurately and give you more hope and give you more of a set of tools to empower yourself to make meaningful changes. So what are we, what are we talking about? Should you measure these things? Of course you should. These are kind of gold standard things that can be measured and certainly they should be. So, you know, get the regular testing, but there's also something called reverse T3 that you want to get tested for. Um, let me explain why real quick. So when you're converting T4 in your liver to T3, sometimes what will happen is your body won't do that very well and instead it will make a substance called reverse T3. Reverse T3 is an iso, it's a stereometric, well, it's a mirror image of T3. So if, if T3 were looking in the mirror, it would see something that looked like reverse T3. But the problem with this is that T3 is active and reverse T3 is inactive. It has one one thousandth of the activity of regular T3. So if your body is making a lot of reverse T3, it's an indicator that your T4 is being used up to make something that doesn't really work very well. Remember what I said earlier is that this requires selenium and it also requires iron. And so if you're low in either one of these, you're, you might be making too much reverse T3 and might not be making enough regular T3 or active T3. And so this test can be measured. It's a simple blood test. Your insurance will cover it. LabCorp and Quest Diagnostics, these major labs that are across the countries, um, will, this test is in their battery of tests. It's not like you, if you ask your endocrinologist to run this test, it's not like pulling teeth. Is something they should be able to run relatively easy. Now, all of these things on this top list uh, are tests that they should be able to run relatively easy. Again, that's that's these things here. Now, the rest of the tests, you know, as we go down the rest of this, now you may be asking more than what they're capable, or not necessarily not more than they're capable of doing, but more than they're comfortable doing and this is where you have to find a good doctor this is where you have to push and be your own advocate but these are some additional tests that you really want to make sure that you're asking for one is called an iodine loading test and an iodine loading test is where your doctor gives you 50 milligrams of iodine to take and then you collect your urine for 24 hours and then you're measuring how much iodine you of that 50 milligrams how much of that iodine are you peeing out over the course of that 24 hours because if your body is saturated with iron, if your thyroid, and, and ladies, if your breast tissue is saturated with enough iodine, then if you take 50 milligrams, pretty much 90% uh, of that 50 milligrams should be coming out in your urine. In other words, your body is saturated and doesn't need any more. And so an iodine loading test can really help you understand better your iodine levels. A good iodine loading test, though, will also measure the other halides. So it will measure the bromine and the fluoride to see if you're being over brominated or over fluoridated in any sense. And I, I can say I, I use this test as a kind of a standard test when I'm assessing someone's nutrition. And I probably see one in two, about 50% of the people that I measure will have high fluoride. Um, and, and it's because of their drinking water typically. Once we filter their water or change the water habit, their drinking water habits and change their fluoridated toothpaste, generally that, that fluoride corrects. Then we also have testing called lymphocyte proliferation. 
Um, this type of testing can measure all of these things over here. So all the nutrients, right? You can measure, um, we actually, if, if, for those of you whose doctors won't do this, if you go visit Gluten-Free Society, we have, um, we have this type of testing available direct to consumer. We're actually measuring 55 different nutrients um, through this technology. And this is just a, a fantastic way to assess your overall nutritional status. Now, in addition, you should have your thyroid antibody testing done. This is also something that, you know, just like these tests up here can be ordered and is typically ordered. It's not a big ask, but there's a few different kinds of antibodies. There's standard, there's something called TPO. TPO is thyroid peroxidase antibodies. And then there's another one called anti thyroglobulin antibodies, um, antithyroglobulin and TPO. These are the two primary antibodies associated with Hashimoto's thyroiditis. Now, if you suspect you have hyperthyroidism or Graves' disease, there's a different kind of antibody called T TSI. That stands for thyroid stimulating immunoglobulin and so it's a basically it's a it's a type of antibody that's that stimulates or, or or behaves like thyroid so it'll actually elevate your thyroid status but it's a stimulating immunoglobulin so again that's more for graves hyper thyroidism versus Hashimoto's. So these two over here are more Hashimoto's. This one is Graves. Um, I would suggest that you ask your doctor to screen you for gluten sensitivity. Um, based on everything I showed you today, gluten sensitivity genetic screening. Again, if your doctor refuses to do that, this is another test that Gluten-Free Society offers and you can go visit us there. I'll put some links below uh, in the show notes for you if you want to check those out. You should be food allergy or sensitivity tested because other foods can also trigger autoimmune thyroid reactions. Gluten is just the most well studied, but other foods can do it as well. And so rule out whether or not any other foods because that's an easy thing to change. It's very easy to change your diet. Then chemical reactivity. So you can also have chemical immune response testing where you're measuring to see whether you're reacting to certain chemicals, but the best case, um, with chemicals is try to avoid them as much as you possibly can, whether or not your immune system is reacting to them and just the best practice to avoid them. But you should also have heavy metal testing done. There's evidence now linking cadmium and lead to thyroid hormone dysfunction. And so, you know, if you're over the age of 50, you grew up in what we call the lead age, right? It was lead in the gasoline. There was lead in paint. There was lead in toys. There was lead solder in pipes, if you, if you recall Flint, Michigan a few years ago, where all the lead toxicity was occurring and making people very, very sick, lead can contribute to poor thyroid function. We also know that mold and yeast overgrowth can contribute to thyroid hormone dysfunction as well, so it's not a bad idea to look at that. Part of how you assess mold is to also measure mycotoxins, um, which are the toxins that mold produces. And then we also know that abnormal gut bugs, gut bacteria, can contribute to um, thyroid problems through what we were talking about earlier with coffee, which is molecular mimicry. Some of these bacteria produce toxins, and some of these toxins are they're called LPS, lipopolysaccharide toxins, that can mimic thyroid tissue and so what what will happen is your immune system your will will start to try to neutralize these toxins and in the process uh, of being exposed to those toxins your immune system will look at your thyroid and it will look at your thyroid because there's homology because there's molecular mimicry between lps and your thyroid it may start attacking your thyroid in an autoimmune type of response so sometimes people develop hypothyroidism as a result of having abnormal gut bacteria. And so again, 
These things can all be measured. And, you know, honestly, you should insist on the best. You should insist on the best investigation when you're visiting your endocrinologist. Your doctor has a it has an obligation to serve you at a highest level by being investigative and not being dismissive and to just simply run you know these simple tier tests and doom you to medicine for the rest of your life and tell you that diet and environment have nothing to do with thyroid disease and that it's simply genetic that's where you need to look at maybe finding a different doctor and getting a second opinion but i wouldn't settle for you know, just these simplistic tests. Get a full evaluation so that you can ideally get off of medication, empower yourself to make meaningful changes in your diet and lifestyle. Now, when you do that, and if you do that, there's something else you need to be concerned about. And that's some of these symptoms. What I have seen happen in many folks is when they start making diet and lifestyle changes, when they start getting their nutrition deficiencies corrected, their thyroid starts working again. And you know, whereas before it was broken, it wasn't working properly, or there was a breakdown in the way the thyroid was communicating to cells. And so when they made the meaningful diet and lifestyle changes, their thyroid started working again. And if they were taking medication, so this is, for those of you who are on medication, when your thyroid starts working again, the medicine becomes too strong. And some of the common side effects of your thyroid medicine being too strong are hot flashes, heart palpitations, probably in my experience, one of, one of the most common. Mood swings and irritability agitation, angriness, right? This is especially true of women, really, really quick to temper. Trouble sleeping at night, trouble falling asleep and staying asleep at night. Restless leg syndrome, jumpy legs, hair loss. Now this is a symptom of low thyroid as well, right? And as well, anxiety. Usually these two kind of go hand in hand, um, as does here. So if you change your diet and you start supplementing and you're on a medication and you just all of a sudden you start developing these types of symptoms, the quickest I've ever seen it happen, I actually saw it happen in 48 hours. A woman called, uh, she called my practice. Two days after changing her diet, she went gluten free and started taking iodine and then started to develop these symptoms. And um, she actually called me from the emergency room. There was nothing wrong with her. They couldn't find a single thing wrong with her. In her case, her diet change and correction of iodine just made her thyroid medicine too strong. Now, not everybody has that quick of a turnaround, so don't expect that. Generally, as you're changing your diet and getting these things in order, this can take months to kind of start to happen, but I just don't want you to get months through this and start thinking, oh no, I have heart palpitations, I need to go see the cardiologist because I have a heart problem when it could just very well be that your thyroid medicine is too strong. So if you're doing all these things, you really want to work with your doctor and you want to monitor every few months, you want to monitor your TSH, your T3 and your T4. Um, you can also monitor, if you had thyroid antibodies, you can monitor your antibody levels. One of the things that we commonly see in people that make diet and lifestyle changes is their thyroid antibody levels start to plummet. I mean, I see cases where there are thousands off the chart and they'll come down within six months, they'll come down to below 100. So I, I know a lot of endocrinologists will say your antibodies don't matter. Um, they do matter because it's, it's one of the ways you can track the efficacy of your diet and your lifestyle change. It's one of the, one of the kind of the benchmarks that you can use. But again, back to my point, if your T3 and T4 are going up, if they're high, it could be an indication your medicine's now too strong. If your TSH is dropping less than 0.5, it's an indicator that your medicine is too strong. So again, you're looking for T3 and T4 to be too high. You're looking for your TSH to potentially be too low. Those are just clues or indicators that your medicine might be too strong. Again, you wanna, if you're, if you're doing this, work with a good doctor to monitor these values so that when it's appropriate, 
you can potentially lower your medication and in a safe way without crashing or hitting the floor. So just want you guys to be aware of those issues. That's it for tonight. Look, thank you so much for tuning in. I hope you learned something new. If you did, do me a favor. We're trying to save 100 million lives. Please share this video with somebody you know or love or care about, especially if they're struggling with thyroid problems. And if you're new to the channel, make sure you hit that subscribe button and throw me a comment, hit a like. Um, all those things help us reach more people, which is what this is all about. Thanks so much for tuning in. We'll see you next episode of Dr. Osborne Zone. Thanks for tuning in to the Dr. Osborne Zone. Don't forget to share, like, and subscribe for more content like this. And make sure you come back next Tuesday at 6 p.m. Central Standard Time and Thursday at noon 30 for more episodes.